Oh yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you working on over there? Right? Oh, uh, well, I mean, we got this show, right? And so I figured I would just come up with a random table uh, of intros, like the, the tropes that we've done over the years, and just like have a okay. random table of it, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, So that sounds good. All right. So, yeah, I'll just read some entries off of it. So, like, there's obviously the Jim and Pruitt writing and start a conversation uh, trope. Okay. Which, hey, check, yeah. Um, the, obviously, the one I love the most, the, um, the Pruitt misinterprets the subject. Like that's a that's a fan favorite, I think. Also, okay. Which leads me to the next entry, which is coffee tables. Um, coffee tables. So there's that. What? Um, uh, okay. Are, are we? What? What is? Why don't we just tell them? Tell them what we were talking about. Like, what are we? Well, entry four is the straightforward info dump. Uh, so I'm getting to that. So all right. Yeah. What? I I feel like this has gone on way too long. Like, what? What is it that what? you've been working on for the intro, Pruitt? Come on. What is? Well, what is I mean, it? I. It, well, we're getting there. Uh, so entry five on the random table is Jim and Pruitt argue, which uh, we're here. And yeah, so that okay. leads to entry six, which is the meta joke. So now that we've gone through my random table of intros, let's uh, just finish the intro on random tables here on WebDM. This week's episode is sponsored by Hero Forge, the masters of customizable miniatures. If you've never played with their online 3D character creator, you are missing out. They've got so many options. You can make your character exactly the way you want it, and they come out looking great. If you've got a 3D printer, you can download the specs, or they can cast them for you and send them straight to you. Color printing is available now. Just check out this mini that they sent us. Go to HeroForge.com to start designing your custom miniatures today. Link in the comments and description. Okay, here, Jim. Now, as folks may have noticed by the title of this episode, we've uh, we've covered this subject before, <laughs> but I think that in a random chaotic world, it is quite all right to hit on a result again, even though it might be slightly different. So, Jim, let's Certainly. we're talking about random uh, random tables today. Uh, so uh, why are we talking about random tables today? Yeah, today we're getting into the nitty gritty of, of writing your own uh, random tables, building out your, uh, your DMs toolkit. <clears throat> so this is kind of a high concept show where we're building on our previous two episodes about random tables. One of them in defense of random tables from 923.15, like way back in the day. Uh, and then uh, random encounter tables in RPGs uh, from 1010.18, uh, uh, which really delves into like the encounter part of random tables, like building out combat and things like yeah. that from them. Um, so we're sort of assuming that you want to make better use of random tables in your games and that you like already know the basics of their use. If that's not the case, then please go back and rewatch those other two for a bit more context, but you, they're not like necessary or anything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is a game of dice and dice are uh, the harbingers of chance. And so how you want your, to mold that chance is kind of the, the first question you have to ask yourself, right? Like mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. percentage uh, do you, how many outcomes do you want and, and what percentage do you want of those? Yeah. And so, I mean, I think uh, die size, you know, uh, die size the matters blister. here. I, I think that the, you know, the, maybe the general assumption or, or, or this was certainly my case was like the bigger, the better D100 or, or go bust. And like, that's not necessarily the case. Um, and before we like really dig mm -hmm. into it, this is where the website any dice is like great. <laughs> it will it will tell you all kinds of yeah. probability curves or probability distribution. Sorry, oh, yeah. I'm not a mathematician, although we are going to get into uh, mm -hmm. a bit of that uh, in the episode. But I love um, the D4 D12 table, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, for those <laughs> two through sixteen results that you might. <laughs> But you might like, you know, you, who knows? Um, With a really weird curve. Really, really weird. <laughs> but yeah, any dice will will uh, will tell you all kinds of what the probability distributions are, what you know, what the curve actually mm -hmm. is, depending on if you're using multiple dice. It'll show you all kinds of different ways to visualize it uh, and the like. Um, so that's that's sort of like my go-to for what I want out of a table. But that's one thing. We're talking about like actual die size itself. I really stick to four types 
depending on what I want out of a table. And like, hands down, my favorite, the unsung workhorse of the dice bag, the D6, right? Well, it ain't just pretty for Vegas. I no. mean, <laughs> it's it's very important to D&D as well, or just any role-playing right. game. But yeah, because seriously, if you just need to come up with a random table for something for your game today, yeah. are you really going to need more than six entries? Probably not. You're probably not even going to need six, but six is a good number. That's with, the yeah. thing. You're not even going to need six. Yeah. So like one can be a null result, meaning like nothing happens. Sure. And you only need five things. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. I love a good D6 table. Yeah, yeah. So I, the thing that I really appreciate it is that the probabilities break down to like little under 17%. It's like 16.66 or something. I don't, I'm not really sure i've even forgotten from when i looked this up earlier uh so it's mm -hmm. approximately uh 17 chunks and to me that's like a good chunky possibility right uh you know mm -hmm. a one in six chance yeah i mean that's that that's not great but it's still going to come up often enough that you're going to see it and then for me it's like yeah. very easy to break down and sort of visualize what the rest of that is so one through two is like a 33 percent chance right and then mm -hmm. one through three that's 50 percent and so it's just a very i find it's a very elegant way to break things down and to uh you know provide yourself with enough variation that it, it feels like you're actually rolling something random but it's not so granular that it's like Oh, I've like never gotten this result <laughs> that I that I put on there that I was really hoping to get. And so I like for actually using something in session, D6 is what I rely on the most. And and so the way I use it like a lot of the times is to come up with a you know, a list of six encounters or 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 something that uh, you know that I want for that session or that I think would be appropriate for what I know we are going to do. For that session mm -hmm. obviously if they go left where i thought they'd go right that's something else and i'll save those for later but to come up with a a list of six very detailed very appropriate encounters for what's going on not that not that difficult and then if you leave sort of blank spots in there determine like the who the what the why but not necessarily the where for instance um you can like slip them in when they seem appropriate for that time or you can like roll on the table if you want that's the other thing you don't have to roll on these but you have arranged them in such a way that if you can or if you want to it's very easy to and that since i've given myself that that bit of surprise for myself you know that that keep me on my toes uh you know reason for using random tables in the first place or one of them but mm -hmm. i haven't like rolled on something that's completely disconnected from what's going on and then i've got to do a bunch of mental gymnastics to fit it in in that moment sometimes that's fun but it's not i don't always want that you know oh no i i'm i'm right there with you man um because like you were saying like you know when you have those entries that never come up but you really want them to like those are the points where you can make a table but you don't necessarily have to use it if you want something to come up then it should just come up sure. right but i find that uh, since we've talked about random tables so much, usually when I'm doing uh, writing out DM info, that I will write in chunks of either six or eight mm -hmm. or 10 or 12, yeah. like just so that if I want a little randomness, I can just roll whatever the appropriate die yeah. and give it a, just a touch of random. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because like you said, it's it's the spice. It's the spice of yeah. life and we should let it, it should flow. Let it flow. Um, yeah, it, like so it, it, this applies to sort of a lot of my campaign prep. Like if I'm thinking up NPCs, mm -hmm. I'm going to think up six of them. If I'm thinking up yep. locations that I that I want to feature in the campaign, even before like the first session, I'm going to think up probably six of them. Like combat, every every place they go, I'm going to think of six different things that could happen there and and and, and what's going to be interesting about them and make them stand out. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's why I kind of start here. But Jim, sometimes the D6 isn't enough. Sometimes, sometimes you need a little bit more. What's your next go-to? Sometimes you do. D12, baby. It's the D6, yeah. but twice the fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And it's almost like a 2D6 table also. <laughs> almost, right? Almost. Yeah, I, I skip the D8 and D10. I, I, I'm 
if you if they work for you they work for you I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you to stop using them but for me i find that it's either um little like if i want more than six i'm gonna i'm gonna want more than eight or ten as well and the d12 mm -hmm. i like because of the the distribution as well and so it's got like 8.33 percent chunks which is you know half of what you'd get with the d6 and like you mentioned pruitt it's only one away or one more than a 2d6 table so like creating a table that's d12 entries with number one being optional means i have a very easy way of just of determining like mm -hmm. do i want this to be like a, a bell distribution or do i want more flat distribution but what am i looking for in this moment and like constructing right, right. them with the extremes at 2 and 12 and whatever <clears throat> gives me those options and also i like rolling d12s like i never get to and well, any chance yeah. i have to roll one i will take it <laughs> that's why that's why you always play those barbarians in one shot so you can roll a d12 for the hit points so. <laughs> it is it is why i always play barbarians so i get those d12 hit dice <laughs> but mostly i like it because it's it is like a d6 but twice the fun and it helps me mm -hmm. sort of think about okay do i want this to be not a full one pip on a d6 but maybe you know still relevant enough to come up 8.3 something is close to, close enough to 10 percent that i'm satisfied with it and a i just find it more versatile yeah, yeah a couple more options so like an example of how i differentiate between the two of them you know you're rolling through the wilderness i know that they're going to be on the swamp road for the next session or two and i have an idea of what monsters live there and the like i'm going to prep that d6 table with six detailed encounters that are appropriate for that moment but then when they get to the big city that's at the end of the swamp road and i know they're going to be staying there for a long time they've expressed interest in camping out at the city uh and the like um then the d12 is going to be more appropriate because i know i'm going to be rolling on this table more often yeah and so i want enough entries that it keeps things fresh and the like but if i have to come up if i have to like start replacing entries on it it's not going to be too uh i don't know what you call it too difficult to start coming up with new ones you know well and what i like uh in your like you're just using your analogy of like being in a town if you have your d12 table like if it's a town where one of the players maybe knows their way around you could switch that to a 2d6 table and put the more the safer uh you know less deadly things uh right in the middle of the bell curve so they yeah. might get those more often because it represents their knowledge of the town versus yeah. They're going into a brand new town. Anything could happen. Well, now we're rolling on a D12. Every yeah. you know, every option is is equally uh, it, applicable. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way to model that kind of uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The other two dice that I really oh, like yeah. to use, um, D20, the old standby, right? Oh. Probably got a lot of these yeah. lying around somewhere. Oh, of course, you got D20 tables out the wazoo. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's who. Who doesn't love to roll a good D20? I mean, Certainly, if you like right, rolling a D12, yeah. it's just, it's got more sides. It does, it's got more sides. And, you know, the 5% uh, chunks that it's in. It's deep. <laughs> yeah. Chunk is a mathematical term in this uh, in this sense. Um, it, you know, it produces, yes. it produces good results, you know. And if you've got a lot of things you're going to roll on, if you've got a table you're going to roll on a lot, um, a D20 table, can be really nice for that because it still provides a lot of variability and a lot of randomness but it doesn't require too much on the dm's part of like coming up with entries for everything and there's a lot of ways to like split up a right. d20 table you could do like a, a d8 plus a d12 uh which i think we got into in our, our last show on random encounters um so it gives you some options for that and, and it's just like i said you, you probably got a d20 right at hand roll it uh there you go um so d20 tables i might use are like random combat events or or like a critical hit or fumble chart or something like that where it's like this table is going to get rolled on mm -hmm. a lot but i don't need like so much uniqueness to it that i would want to create a d100 table you know right i mean you could still use 2d10 for your d20 table if certainly. you wanted to create a bell curve right you certainly can or you could use your 2d10 for a d100 table like you said sure 
We certainly can. And that's number 100 on the D100 <laughs> segue list. The Magnificent Bastard. The D100. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, it, I, it's one of my favorite. Coming at, like, I've never done a full D100 table myself. Full disclosure. I've started many <laughs> and have always just fizzled out. Like, I think around 60-something. Sure. <laughs> and then it's just like, this is crap. And, you know, whatever. Um but yeah, I love a good deal. Yeah, who doesn't, table. right? Like you're 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 taking things in one percent sort of chunks. Uh, although it is worth noting that because of the way that the D twenty and the D hundred table sort of interact with each other, if you don't have that many entries, maybe you're just making a D twenty table, and and not really thinking of it like that. Um, but I find the D hundred tables are are good for like prep style tables, uh, where it's like I, mm -hmm. I don't know that I want to like. Honestly, there's a lot of times it's DM where like I just don't want to have to choose. <laughs> you know, I'll just roll randomly because it it helps to create those sort of constraints that are going to fuel my uh, you know creativity. Um, so like prep tables, I like a D100 for, or something where I want lots of variety across an entire campaign. Classic example being like a wild yeah. search table. You know, it's like this thing's going to get rolled on a lot. It's not specific to any one part of this campaign. Uh, and, and like it could easily, you know, benefit from having a lot of entries for it. Um, when you run into sort of the, the issue you were talking about of just like you fizzle out after a while, I think understanding that a D hundred table doesn't need to be filled in all at once. <laughs> like you, this is mm -hmm. something you work on and, and kind of come back to. And also the trick that I found is like breaking it down into 10 D 10 tables. Right. So like I want 10 entries on this, yeah. 10 entries on that, et cetera, until you have a full, uh, you know, full hundred entries. Um, and that goddamn brain. You know, Jim. I think I, I'm pretty sure I picked that trick up. It's like, <laughs> like, duh. <laughs> like, duh. Like, duh. Why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> uh, I think I ordered like five D20 tables or something. Uh, but just mm -hmm. make it easier on yourself because yeah if you're trying to go through like you know an exhaustive i'm going to knock this out in one go like a hundred interesting things is difficult you know it, it's it's not like that you know if you can't do it you're lacking in creativity it's just give your brain a break you know so understanding that something like a d100 table be and you know is you don't have to fill it out all at once that that's going to make it a lot more useful for you because like as long as you have enough entries you can start using it earlier than when you might have it completed mm -hmm. and you just sort of like oh i only have 30 entries so it's either either i've got a d30 which you should because d30 is awesome uh or you know you're rolling don't you call classics just get it i you know i i don't like using them in play i don't like having especially if it's like an encounter table type thing because I find them just unwieldy and and not very not very useful in that sense either because mm -hmm. like they take up more than one page in a rule book or, or typed out or something and therefore I can't just look at a glance and see what all's there or because it's like all right I rolled 78 where is that on my chart you know it's just sort of difficult to use in play doesn't mean you never use it. There are situations where it might be useful. Um, but for the most part, I would rather use a D12 or D6 table taken from a D100 table, either that I just you know look at or, uh, or roll on and then create like detailed entries. Another way to use it is just not roll on it. <laughs> just go one, two, three, four. <laughs> like uh, you just arrange them in, in order and just read off the next one. Um, although that kind of mm -hmm. defeats the point of having it be random. So, yeah, that's a trick you can use. Yeah, <laughs> but talking about these, you know, do you roll on a, your D100 or is it, you know, something broken down for more of a curve? I, I've mentioned, I touched on it earlier, and we've talked about it before many times. So, so talking about that single, you know, like probability versus a more of a curve. Let's okay. let's delve into that. Let's see uh, how many entries we can hit on certainly, this. Certainly, certainly. So number of dice, that's what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. And you might see in your internet perusal of RPG topics, the D20 referred to as swingy. It's a very swingy dice. And 
Well, you, you roll it when you swing to hit something. Certainly. Sure, yeah. That's what I, for years, that's what I thought it meant. <laughs> like, literally <laughs> for years. I was like, yeah, I guess it is swingy because I use it to hit things when I swing. But what they're referring to is that flat distribution, right? It's the yeah. fact that, that each possible result is equal to the other because you're just doing the one die, right? And yeah. You usually see it as like, oh, this is terrible. Oh, you shouldn't. It's swinginess. Mm. And it's like, wait a minute. That's the point of using it. You know, it's yeah. a feature, not a bug. <laughs> and yeah. You, there are plenty of situations where you want there to be an equal chance of everything happening because a mm -hmm. reliable middle, right? The, the middle portion of those, uh, you know, the bell curves that could be really boring <laughs> you know that can reduce produce a lot of samey results another example of this is like the 2d6 reaction roll table we've mentioned this oh, a yeah. lot in different kinds of shows of of having you know the this sort of roll this die to see what the monsters think whatever um mm -hmm. and criticism of that is that the six through eight entry the most likely outcome is neutral nothing happens standoff yeah. You know, both parties just kind of look at each other and go their separate ways. And there's some of that that can be mitigated, mitigated with like DM skill, things like that, player choice. The fact that that comes up the majority of the time might be a problem, right? You might not want to have to constantly do that, you know, constantly mitigate for it. Mm -hmm. We've talked about before is when you just, you know, throw in a D8 instead of a D6 on one of those. So... It sure. Bumps yeah, up change the chances up a of a higher result to to change it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's also why I keep a D twelve handy. But that's what we're talking about. Yeah. We say like avoiding that boring middle. Now, some of that can be you know how you construct the tables, things like that. But if you're thinking, how many dice do I want to roll on this chart, and is it in are you using it for play or are you using it for prep? This is something to consider, because maybe you do want to roll multiple dice, right? Well, yeah. Uh, because having that that kind of middle ground to 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 you know rest on is what you want. Um, maybe yes, yeah. You want something a little yeah, bit more stable a as a result. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Like you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, you're going to use something with multiple dice because that represents a reliability that comes through familiarity. You know, so if you're mm -hmm. if you've got a chart of like random encounters through the city, my rogue knows you know about this place when they roll on this we're going to use two dice when anybody else does we're going to roll on you know with just one die and that's the kind of that's the sort of trick that you can use when when constructing the table and like the order you put things in to help you out with that but the real question here is when you're rolling multiple dice is do i want one result to come up more often right or mm -hmm. or do i want it to you know to come up less often you know if you're doing something like an encounter table maybe you put the really rare creatures at the ends of that that curve that you know thinking of 2d6 still you know your twos and your oh, yeah. 12s are the big monsters you know the, mm -hmm. the, the boss types who are maybe not always out of their lair but they could be and that smaller chance represents the fact that they might be out, but they might not. But more than likely, you're going to run into the foot soldiers or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, most definitely. And what I like to do is uh, the two is is bad. If you get that, it's a tough fight, and there's not a lot of good about it. But if you get the 12, yeah. it's going to be a tough fight, but maybe you get more reward at the end of it. And that's, that's usually Certainly. kind of how yeah. I uh, s spread mine out, usually. Yeah. Yeah, because I uh, love the two d six and the three d six table. I yeah, I do. I, I mean, the three d six is one of those that I didn't really consider till I came across uh, Hot Springs Island, and this is this is the product that I've really seen it used to good effect in, because the arrangement of entries on the encounter tables for Hot Springs Island are reflective of of those sort of probabilities that are going to come up, the distribution of them. And so mm -hmm. whether you're rolling on a, a table of beasts, you can start learning things about the environment you're in based on which entries come up a lot or more frequently. But then the whole mm -hmm. premise of this 
is that there is a small island that you will repeatedly go to on, on, on multiple, multiple expeditions, some of them with the express purpose to scout out a place and, and, and get a feel for who lives there so that you know where different layers are, who's there, what which faction controls which part of the island. And so when you're thinking of something like 3D6 or 5D4 or whatever, you know, however many you want, um, think about the benefits of it. It really benefits from the style of play where you keep visiting the same location over and over again so that the way the probabilities are distributed becomes a strength of it and not a weakness. Mm-hmm. And because you're rolling on it a lot, the chance that the, the you know, the extremes of that are going to come into play is more likely, you know. So that's another thing to consider on how many uh, how many oh. dice you're going to roll on your random tables. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I've, I've mentioned this, I think, I'm pretty sure I mentioned this in the last, uh, last show we did. Uh, or maybe I didn't. Maybe it was too long ago. Anyway, the uh, yeah. my 3D6 tables for my Cypher game, uh, Breath of the Fall, sure. yeah. were were ex- explicitly, probably actually from that last episode we did. Um, but I, I, the way I arranged all of those encounters, um, where you just you worry about your 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 like ten and eleven, right in the middle of your 3D6. Those are your mm-hmm. your mm-hmm. obvious, and you do your extremes, and then you I would just work my way towards the center with more yeah. likely uh, you know encounters till you get to those yeah. things that happen all the time, and and right. uh, you know the probability divide on on a three D six table is is pretty insane when you look it up. Uh, it's it's pretty really, fun where you go from you swing from like fourteen <laughs> percent down to like one and a half percent or less than one percent at the end. There's, yeah, the, the um, threes and eighteens are less than one percent. Yeah. And, yeah, and that's why any, uh, that's why I mean, it's, any dice, right? That'll really help you. Oh yeah, totally, totally. But uh, you know, it's the same as you know, rolling an eighteen while rolling up a three d six character, like that Certainly. shit's gonna be rare. And so yeah. you know, but <laughs> when you hit those entries, it should be it should be uh, something to write home about for sure. And uh, I know that yeah. that only happened like once or twice uh, using my random uh, encounter tables. And when it happened, it was a big deal. It was a big damn deal, um, and so nice. that's Very but cool. that's what you get when using a, a table like that. Yeah, and I think when you're, if, if I'm remembering correctly, you y'all that campaign was spent in pretty much the same location, visiting the various well, like descending, satellite areas of just it. Just descending. Or, yeah, well, no, it was just <laughs> descending uh, a, a, an okay. endless hole in the ground or in the quote unquote ground. Uh, but it turned out being the nasal passage of a colossal beast. Um, oh, and yes. so, yeah, yeah, yeah so it was, very, there, there was some sameness about it, but it, it, it constantly changed. And, uh, once we got later on, I actually started using a slightly different dice to, to get the more extreme results, um, yeah. uh, on my encounter table, just to kind of show mm-hmm. that things are getting a little weirder now. And so the weirdness yeah. will happen more often. Um, yeah, and yeah. so, but you know, th- I had a lot of fun with that, uh, with those tables in that campaign. Yeah, I, I, I recall uh, having a lot of uh, conversations with you about it. Um, it seems mm-hmm. like you, it seems like you did get a lot out of the, uh, out of those tables. Like gold bloomed a lot. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's the word I was looking for. Um, mm-hmm. You can also double up entries on those. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have mm-hmm. to be that every inch like there's a three has this entry a four has this entry you could go like all right three through seven is this you know mm-hmm. so that you can play around with uh the entries in that way so that you can get uh you know more of what you want but still have yeah. a uh, variable distribution <clears throat> well i i, I the, did uh, um i did like pirates but, and then uh, a less uh, ob- or a less likely uh instance would be the pirate's cove and so that's how I kind of doubled up. You're still going to run into pirates at the Pirate Cove, but now you're actually in their base. And I did yeah. the same with, like, the cannibals that were everywhere, and then there were cults. And so each of those technically had two entries. More likely you'd run into a cannibal. Less likely mm-hmm. you'd run into a cannibal uh, domicile, which, as the entry on the table said, you can stay for dinner, but it'll be your last meal. And so, <laughs> like... <laughs> great that's um, great <laughs> i was proud of that anyway. uh, one, <laughs> right 
so I, I'd like to talk about one last sort of multiple die table uh, mm-hmm. that I didn't, I wasn't aware of when we we filmed our last show on random tables, but have since become like really enamored with, and that is the D sixty six table. The D sixty six has thirty six entries, I believe. And it goes from 11 to yep. 66. And you read it exactly the same way you do a D, D, uh, 100. One of them is the tens. One of them is the ones, right? And so it's got a good spread of entries. You've got the dice probably right there. And it provides enough variability that you're going to get a lot of that randomness, a lot of that, uh, you know, what you're looking for in like, not quite a D hundred, but you want more than a D twenty table. It arranges nicely mm-hmm. into a grid, you know, so that you've got the six, you know, one through six on one, one through six on the other, and you kind of like have your entries all at one glance. It's just a fun kind of way of arranging things for a, a table for yourself, and because you can sort of group things together, like okay, everything that that's like you know one, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, up through sixteen, like that's all one type. Of, of, of encounter or, or entry, right? And that means you can then just roll a D6 on it if you want. You know, you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to roll two of them. But oh, yeah. if you don't want to, you want the full range of the, the 36 entries, you roll the two dice. So D66 table is one of those that I've started to use a lot more in my games. Uh, Jim, you've already, uh, my mind is already blossoming with the 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 column uh, row like ways that you could possibly like arrange your entries so you can roll a d6 one way or the other way based on two variables but they're all in the same like world and i'm gonna try to just put that on the shelf because i'm i'm already like background gold blooming and so right New tables yeah. coming up soon. New tables. There you go. Um, <laughs> that, so I mean, so we, we've spent way longer on just like the dice than I thought we would, but I, I think it's good. Um, actually wow. f- arranging these things. What is the, what is the layout of them uh, is something that's yeah, worth well, considering. Oh, definitely. The nested sub table, right, is, mm-hmm. is one of those I think that, that you've used where you've got this like master table or the first table that you're rolling on and then each entry generates its own sub table reference and oh, definitely. i like these <laughs> i like these mm-hmm. for especially for prep right these are really handy wow. i've i've my favorite is the d100 nested table where it's like this thing's 40 something pages long <laughs> because each entry that you roll on a d100 has its own separate table and sometimes they're like two or three tables deep you know and oh it's insane. this is for the <laughs> this is for the big world building the you know uh, this we the city state style like the giant metropolis uh or something where you mm-hmm. want a lot of variability and and even within individual entries you know you don't want just a noble for instance you want to know what they're doing yeah who they've got with them uh you know what's going on with them, what do they want with the players that kind of thing so uh, nested oh, yeah. with subtables is good for like generating adventures or like detailed plot hooks, that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm a big fan of putting the subtables in the main entry because if I've got to go look up in a different place <laughs> where the subtable is, then I'm just going to be grumpy about it and less likely to use that result, especially if I'm trying to do something with it like quickly, you know. Um, so mm-hmm. I will arrange these as like a d20 table with d6 sub entries so that it kind of all fits you know in, in one place by the way this is where excel or google sheets is like super handy for creating these tables uh I, but um if you're uh if you've oh, been I, following me for a while you know how much i like spreadsheets for dming so surprise surprise yeah my my, my girlfriend is going to get me more into spreadsheets uh, very soon. I can feel it uh, because I would definitely yeah. want to redo my uh, my Breath of the Fall tables, uh, you know, with slightly different names um, in a Google sheet where I could do them like at a click. You can bring up, you know, because yeah. I mean, I did a 3D8 table for their main entry and then three like you roll 3D6. Um, at first, I was using the initial roll and then looking at the individual mm-hmm. dice. But then I started realizing how the sameness of those dice were giving me same results in the nested table. 
So then I started doing <laughs> things like inverting the dice or reshuffling them or yep. just doing a whole new roll on the nested table. Anyway. But like doing that, it can give you, depending on what your categories are on the nested table, like I found like, like, um, like just an example, cultist. If you roll a cultist, right on on this on my entry here and then you roll your 3d6 again you have one row that's how many so it goes anywhere from 1d6 2d6 3d6 to a leader and more uh people that's one row on your d6 so you know how many what are they doing are they having first prayer is it a ritual sacrifice is it the daily meal is it training time yeah. are they at rest or are they executing a goal so you now you have some motivation for them and then what yep. is their goal what is this cult's main goal which for me like i have Unleash the techno virus, dispersed mutagen, find their prophet, uh, which we had one time, and I believe that it was Grant's character who pretended to be the prophet, and they believed him, um, nice. and it was amazing. But uh, destroy the fall, see the face of the fall, or destroy Aru, the city that they all came from. And so, like, I, but what I tried to do was make sure that all of the like the big things, like if it had a goal or if, uh, if there was a location that was important, like you want to tie it to your other tables. So now you start having interconnectivity and you can start creating yep. whole encounters and plots from your random tables if you really start like piecing them together and just like like I that's where I really got to gold blooming and that's why I only finished like the first third of my tables because I was too busy like <laughs> trying to make sure they were so interconnected that yeah that I I never like just I could have just shotgunned it past it and gone to my next ones but i just i you know you know me <laughs> no um, I, I think it's worth it to make them interconnected like that because then it, it, mm -hmm. it makes them richer and the entries that you're going to get from them are more complex and more like in, you know like usable in that moment uh mm -hmm. you know is to, to drive adventure and the thing you can do with like nested sub tables is you can also combine them with a multi-column format where you can either read entry straight across everything for number one they all have the same entry mm -hmm. uh, or you can roll for each column but like having them side by side is the, is the big asset here uh, a lot of yeah. times you'll see like for instance the fifth edition dmg does a lot of this where it's like these are all the tables for weather but they're all separate tables listed across a couple of pages when it's like why don't you guys just stick them all side by side <laughs> and make it easier on us to use uh, the multi-column <laughs> format is really just about ease of use you know, not having to look at separate places, not having to, uh, you know, refer to separate entries. It's all right there. You can roll separately on each column or read across a lot of different ways you can use it when they're presented side by side. You can even do nested tables the same way where, you know, each column has its own entries and then the, the nested tables are listed in the entry. And then you just have the different columns that have different you know whatever you want on them number appearing activity motivation that kind of thing um yeah yeah and so so much of this i found was was like it's not just am i going to roll on this table but like how you arrange them which which die you consider using like so much of it influences how you actually use the tables and what benefit you get from them that I really went down a rabbit hole when I first started <laughs> looking at my tables because oh. before then I was like, oh, it's a D hundred. Who cares? <laughs> well, yeah, but yeah, what I love about this is the 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 wild swing and variability of what you end up with. I mean, it's it's insane. Like it's like, well, tonight you're either gonna bake a cake or you're gonna build a car, and it's all from the same yeah. table. And it's just like, it's all like from the same thing. I yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and I, that's what I love about it is who knows what's going to happen. Y'all could find like something awesome, or you could get attacked by the worst things possible, yeah. or just a random thing pops into the in from an, another dimension and you know swoops you away. Or who sure. knows? Like that's that's what I love about it. Like like yeah. getting to fill in all those little details. That's just like you never know. It depends on what the dice says at this moment, and like having yeah. that kind of that that craziness like i enjoy doing it right before the session as opposed mm -hmm. to like getting all prepared or doing it right at the moment like yeah. all right we're gonna go down here well let's see what you find let's and you find. that yeah. way it kind of it kept me like fresh and and I, i'm more of an improv person anyway so giving me a prompt is a much mm -hmm. easier way to to kind of spark that kind of creativity and make it it, you know exciting and dramatic because i have the info of that thing written down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't need to come up with all the lore and everything i already wrote the lore 
now I just yeah. actually get to present it in a in a in a in a bout of spontaneity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think like that distinction between is this something I'm going to use during my prep or is this something I'm going to use at, you know, while we're playing can influence mm -hmm. what, you know, how you arrange everything and, and, and what you do to use it. Like to me, usability is priority when I'm thinking of things in play, but then how I arrange the entries and how many dice I'm having to roll really influences usability. And, uh, yeah. you know, whereas the complex nested multi-column, you know, whatever, that's more for prep, but that doesn't mean I can't take elements of that and insert it into a more usable format that I can then have mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, when I'm actually running a session. And so that's, yeah. that's yet another thing to consider <laughs> when crafting these and, well, and go ahead. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, because everybody's different. And so it's just like, yeah. but knowing it's one of those things where you don't know what you don't know. So like yeah. knowing all of the options that you could have at hand and how you can interact with those, depending on if you're more of a prep DM versus just like, you know, you like to wing it with just a little bit of notes beforehand, or maybe mm -hmm. you write the notes as you go. It doesn't really matter. But like yeah. having the right table in front of you uh, and knowing the probabilities that can give you the best experience to present your players. Like that's right. what I that's what I love about this conversation. It's just like we got to get it all out on the table so everybody can choose what they want. Yeah, yeah, and I I think that like it's worth going into the big detail because of that because there are choices to make when you're crafting them for yourself, and mm -hmm. the choices you make are going to influence how it's used in play. Like saying, I'm curious for you, bro. Like when you start thinking of what you're going to actually put in the entries the content uh -huh. of them what is it um what is it that you want like how do you determine what goes in these well i mean uh, what i usually have is um i'll come up with like say if we're talking about an npc table that like a non-specified npc table i did this for uh my fantasy home game i just had like a, a, a row of names and a row of pr mm -hmm. professions and in a row of quirks because I didn't want to just like, oh, the blacksmith who's a dwarf and is grumpy. Like, no, no, no. Let's see what we roll. And what I rolled was the the um, out of place human who is trying to get back home, but they know how to craft. And so they figured out how to yeah. craft, even though they're from a more advanced timeline or a more advanced place, but they're stuck in this kind of fantasy world. But they're very motivated to get home, so they want to work with everyone. They want to hear all the rumors, so they they kind of function like a the the like the innkeeper or the bartender, where they're the kind of the rumor mm -hmm. mill. And so, yeah. like, I look I look at like what do I need um, for this particular table or, or area, whatever it is. Um, and mm -hmm. and for that, I just wanted spontaneity with my NPCs to to kind of spark a little bit different of an outcome and to not think about it like and have it all written down in my head or on paper beforehand and so right. uh yeah i mean that's that's mostly like how i how i looked at the last like big set of tables that i made uh for that game yeah yeah i you? i find that you? i'm yeah I, I find that i i've refined sort of how i craft these entries over the years like i used to just throw everything on there especially when I was making you mm -hmm. know, giant D20 tables or something. But the more of them I create and the more <clears throat> games that I find I'm using them in, I find myself asking questions like, all right, what, what do I really need this thing for? Because one of the things that, that I discovered with my gameplay was like, I'll create these giant tables <laughs> in prep because there's all the ideas floating around. There's so much going on. But like when I get to the table, I, I don't need you know most of this and that's what it, that's what sort of pushed me towards having the the specific d6 table that i mentioned at the top of the show like that's what i need mm -hmm. in those moments is just six entries of whatever it is right doesn't have to be encounters it could be just about anything um mm -hmm. the other thing is like I, what do i want to improvise at the table that i like that's going to that's going to energize me and get my creative juices flowing versus what don't i i want to have to deal with i want to deal with this ahead mm -hmm. of time so that I don't have to think about it. Names is a great one of those. 
just oh, names yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> like i i'm not going to want to improvise names otherwise you're going to get some really really stupid names out of me well you're billium. you're in high fantasy it's where that yeah, one or, <laughs> or yeah billion or uh, what my problem is uh, we're in high fantasy or crazy sci-fi and there and i have to think of a name off the top of my head and it's like his name's brad right just, that's it just brad <laughs> like, that happened to me damn. recently and it was like i forget <laughs> what the drow's name were but i was like it's St stahiv stahiv and chad so stahiv, yeah. chad yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and those fucking you know, apostrophes <laughs> of course thank you drow and your apostrophes right they became <laughs> quite popular with with the group uh because of their because they were named steve and chad but i maybe don't want that <laughs> for most of my <laughs> most of my yeah, uh, entries so that's something i won't uh, always improvise i go back and forth on where the ideas come from you know oh you, you, oh, you mean like uh trying to be completely original versus using like that's influence and 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 all that kind of stuff yeah i i i find that too i i usually try to um if i know i'm going to use a lot of uh things from other sources i try to at least have three of them and blend them yeah. together like Certainly. three ideas yep. from three separate sources that are all kind of similar, bl mm -hmm. put them in a bl mental blender and then come out with that so that yeah. it, there's yeah. an obvious homage. There's a nod, but it's not a direct ripoff. Yes. Yeah. If that makes yeah, sense. The three, the three is, yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. The three is the key there because you can do two, but uh, three is, is the, sort of the minimum in this case. And mm -hmm. I, to me, the benefit is like if the third one is, is out of left field. You know, the two that are kind yeah. of similar, two ideas that, that seem, you know, compatible. And then the third one is like, what? <laughs> uh, so if we're talking monsters, yeah. then it, it's something that's uncharacteristic for that monster. If we're talking NPCs, it's just something weird or random mm -hmm. or something that I otherwise wouldn't think up. Um, but I sometimes will take it in a different direction and go like, all right, I've got my idea. I've got my original idea. I'm just going to let it sit. And then I'll come back to it and add something different. Mm -hmm. That second element that I'm adding is going to be just slightly off because I've given it time to cook. And then I come back to right, it right. a third time and you've and now it's a little bit different. And maybe each time I, I do a pass on it, I'm looking for something specific to add. Like, OK, this time I'm looking for a way to change things, change the theme or tone or whatever of this up so that it's not predictable. So that's how I kind of keep my own ideas fresh. But I'll be honest, like using someone else's ideas is really great for these kind of things mm -hmm. because it helps you break out of those ruts. But also like you're tapping into their imagination, which is leaving more of your own for the important things in your game. Right. Yeah. Like th this is where it just and it's there's so many so so many tables out there many of them the majority of them for free if you just go look mm -hmm. right there's a lot out there there's people slash like, behind the tables on reddit behind the tables slash d100 yeah. those are just on reddit right yeah just, yeah that's just reddit but you <laughs> you'll be good for a that. couple of years with just those <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah so don't be afraid to just take take other things make them your own take something else and do passes on it right mm -hmm. uh those are ways you can really get something uh you know really bring all the creative juice out of it um because what oh, i yeah. find is that when i don't when i just do what comes to me first and, and i'm not looking for outside influence the entries i make up can be very mundane these are rats mm -hmm. and bandits and spiders and goblins and why did I make up this table? Because I could have just picked those out of my brain. Like, yeah. the, I think the number one thing I look to avoid when making a table is mundane stuff. What's predictable? Mm -hmm. What is not boring, for lack of a better word, right? And, like, to me, the quintessential one of these is D6 goblins. You know, just hanging out, one through six of them, maybe more. Yeah. Like, even just adding what they're doing and how many there are can spice that up. But, like, what benefit mm -hmm. is it to include mundane things or predictable things in a, in a random table? Like, if you're only going to roll in this a handful of times and you're introducing that element of randomness, shouldn't each mm -hmm. of these be, like, whoa, that 
I did, where did that come from? Like, I would only say that um, you could have some, some mundane, but it needs to be in a nested table that has one column that is just wildly outlandish. Mm, because that's okay. the only way, like, mundane, there's nothing wrong with mundane. It's putting the night, it's putting your own spin on it. D6 golems, that's one thing. D6 golems that you stumble on in a basement that are having fight club, sure. and they all turn around and go, if it's your first night, you gotta fight. It's like, well, shit. Uh, sure. <laughs> right. Wait, you all don't want to fight me? I just need to fight one of you? Like, like, and then you get in goblin fight club. So, yeah. like, that's just, like, that's the way my brain works. Like, when I, when I, when I try to come up with tables like this, I'm like, I want instances that would happen on Downton Abbey, but in locations like Game of Thrones and the NPCs from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Like, that's yeah. how, like, my rule of three usually comes together on my tables. Like, yep. I try to pick very disparate things. Some of them can be very normal <laughs> things that would happen or places that they would happen or people they would happen to. But you got to put that mustard on it and give it a little spin. Yes. And that's that's how that's how you can kind of have the touchstone of normalcy with a spice of just the outlandish that that can really like people can can see what you're doing but like go whoa wait, i'm sorry what they're doing what yeah. um and so i don't know that's, no i i think you're spot on there and it's a good sort of frame of mind to be in um mm -hmm. sort of related to that whether it's mundane predictable is like how much specificity are you going into in your entries like if you're keeping yeah. them generic, you can use them over and over again. Uh, it, it might mm -hmm. require you to do more in the moment to spice them up, but you will run into a problem when you make them too specific of like, well, this is really the only time I can use this. You know, now yeah. that might be okay. That's sort of what I do when I create them for individual sessions is like, all right, if this doesn't come up this session, I'm either going to break it back up and, and you know, it, it goes back into its own little bins and maybe it'll come up again uh, or, or reskin it or reflavor it in, in another context. But like this exact entry is not going to come up again. This is the one time that it will. This is the only time this NPC is going to show up or that I'll use this plot hook or this rumor or whatever. And then I scratch it mm -hmm. out and write in something else afterwards. And that kind of touches on the usability versus complexity that we mentioned earlier, because like it's more complex, more work to create the specific ones. Sometimes the generic ones are more usable, but then you run into the issue of them being kind of predictable and mundane. So all of these things are balanced against each other when you're creating them, which is why we spent time talking about like, well, what are you actually doing with this table? What is its actual purpose? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't, care that it's generic and predictable like you're just looking for a little bit to spark your imagination yeah you know what would you say jim is the one thing that people need to avoid like more than anything Ooh. when trying to construct these tables yeah. what is it that, what is it more than anything they should what, what's a on? what's a big pitfall that you think like the the biggest pitfall that people can again fall sure, into sure um other than just making all your traps pit trap. right <laughs> um. uh, so the, the the most common sort of pitfall that they might run into when they're uh -huh. uh, when they're writing these tables for themselves and i think creating something unwieldy would be my yeah you know be the thing like it's no one specific like never put rats on your table or never put boring names on your table or whatever but it's like creating something that you have to like really pause the game and suss out you know mm -hmm. part of the appeal and and utility of a random table is that you just roll on it and and can slip it in and and you know sort of effortlessly right but if it's taking you a long time to like work through the process of it or read the entry and and figure out how you're going to use it then you might have been better off just prepping the one thing and not having the random element of it. And right. then if you're, you know, if you're going for the more generic table that doesn't have, you know, specificity, it's just like one entry. This is how many monsters are there. Or this is whatever, you know, whatever this is, the tavern or, or whatever, you know, you're kind of, that's when you start crossing those lines of, 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 this seems weird and out of place 
-hmm. you know so there are these two extremes that that you're trying to avoid with your random table and both of them kind of produce the same result which is that it stops the flow of play and creates a situation where either the players are thrown out of it going like this seems really weird and random or just a minute i gotta go look this thing up and you know give me give me a few minutes while i figure out what's going on here which could still end up with the this seems really weird and random so the mm -hmm. the pitfall that that i think you know dms should avoid in this is getting into either of those two extremes where you're not really using the tool for its intended purpose which is a creativity spark create something that's emblematic of your world gives it a sense of place and is easy for you to use whatever criteria that is maybe you gotta experiment for a while um mm -hmm. so yeah i, I think you know, it's kind of a wishy-washy answer right it's both but <laughs> that the pitfall would be making something you can't use <laughs> well yeah no i i, I agree because uh, I, I have done that. Uh, like I tried to make one of those, uh, I forgot what the what it, what it's called, but you told me about it uh, where you use one of every die. Oh, yeah, the roll, roll of the die like tables, a, yeah. Like a tableau yeah. uh, that's all connected mm -hmm. or whatever. And uh, I tried to do one of those one time, except using it at the table. Oh, yeah. And it was like, hang on. And like 10 minutes later, it was like, <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. I got it. And it's like, maybe I should have done this 30 minutes ago, like yes. before the session. Yes. And so, uh, I, dude, I have fallen into that trap yeah. as well. Let's read a patron question. In case y'all didn't know, we've got a whole community over on Patreon with lots of different rewards. We've got a whole other podcast. There's a level with a hangout, discounts, and all kinds of stuff. And we read a question from one of our patrons every week here on the podcast. So here we go. Let's see here. All right. Our first, uh, our first Patreon yeah. question here. How do I most efficiently deal with my players searching for traps, secret doors, asking if the doors are locked in every single room? It's getting kind of old, and I find it really disrupts yeah, the flow of yeah, play. Yeah, I can, certainly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you, like, I think I made this mistake early in my DMing where I put too many traps. Sure. So you scar your players, yeah, yeah. and they do that. Um, but to me, I think, Jim, what I like to do to kind of give that some breadth is when, as they're going through, like the doors are open, yeah. like yeah, there's no, no, they're not locked or, or when they come up to a door, it's like, yeah, you go up to a door, you can tell it's not locked. It's barely, yeah. you know, you know, just kind of give them some space and give them some information up front to, to, to set their mind at ease so they can just continue yeah, to play. Yeah. That, that's the right? key thing. They're setting their mind at ease. Cause I think you're right. Like a lot of this behavior comes from, I don't know what you call it. It's not necessarily antagonistic DMing, but it can be where it's like, yeah, every square foot of this place is dangerous. And like, maybe it wasn't even mm -hmm. like a, a direct experience they had. They've just sort of absorbed general kind of, uh, you know, this is what D and D should be kind of thing kind of related to the, every DM out there talks about how much of a killer they DM they are. And yet their, their games continue and nobody, <laughs> you know, it's not riddled mm -hmm. with bodies. Um, so yeah, I, to me, like I start this with, with, with just an I just like letting them know, like, Hey, I'm assuming you're doing this in the same way that I'm assuming your characters are eating and taking care of their equipment and, and <laughs> go into the bathroom and like all of these things that if we, if we touched on them every time it happened, we wouldn't get through anything. We can just sort of assume right. your characters are searching. Your characters are looking for things, especially in a dangerous dungeon environment. Like just assuming that the characters are, proceeding slowly maybe, you know maybe it's just a matter of saying like yeah you guys are moving at half speed that would be what you would do if you were traveling for instance and keeping a slow pace because you're doing something else right if this was a day of travel mm -hmm. they'd be traveling at a slow pace so that they could hunt they could be getting advantage uh on their uh, perception checks right <clears throat> so just assuming right, right. that that's what they're doing from the first position right from the from the get-go and like communicating to them that like, yeah, you're, I'm going to use your passive perception to, to note these things. A lot of them, I'm, I'm not even going to use that. I'm just going to, if it seems obvious, I'm going to let you know. And like mm -hmm. that coupled with 
a change in how you present these things. Because a lot of times there's this, like, you know, this idea of, okay, I can't just tell them there's a trap there. Can I like, yeah, that's actually the more interesting option, <laughs> right? Like now they can interact with well, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think a, maybe a good way is if they say that they're going through the dungeon searching for traps. So obviously, like you said, they're traveling yeah. at half speed, but you, you have your passive perception, but if they're actively looking, I don't see a problem with giving a bonus to their oh, passive certainly not. perception. Yeah. Like a plus five, like yeah. a plus five bonus to that, just so you don't yeah. have to roll. Um, and then it's then it's like, yeah, you notice uh, the floor just kind of moves. Funny yeah, when, when somebody, somebody steps on it. Yeah, on it. I, I know a lot of people don't like using passive perception either with or without advantage, which is where that plus five would get you, right? Um, because then it sort of feels mm -hmm. like it's binary. I either have the score or I don't. And all right, I, that's fair enough, right? I, that's why I err on the side of letting them know, like, and not just like, oh, there's a trap here, but like you're saying, the floor seems weird or, you know, the, the middle of the floor <laughs> or this hallway sure has a lot of dust and debris on it, but the sides of it don't, which would normally be the opposite. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, or, yeah. you know, the, the, the stone on the walls here, you yeah, catch, the catch a draft, draft something. Yeah, you catch a draft. Yeah, you hear the click through, of something you know, in the walls. Things like that. You know, or you smell something. Just whatever, you know. It, it could even be that, uh, other than like sensory details, mm -hmm. that, that part of it is stories they've heard or, or overhear snippets of conversation elsewhere. Like, oh, you know, be careful when you're going down the west side of the dungeon because that's where we put all those new traps. Um, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. something to give them a clue so that then they can interact with it. Cause like, that's the interesting part here is not like the finding of it, but the interacting with it. And, um, yeah. once you've done that, like, then you can actually get to something that doesn't disrupt the flow of play, but is actually sort of a part of it. Even if it's like, mm -hmm. you, you know, yeah, instead of this pit trap being hidden is just like a huge pit trap. Like there's just the floor gives way. And now it's an obstacle to overcome, not a gotcha. That's an HP mm -hmm. tax, right? Right, right. Uh, and and also to to something I've learned from Cipher is to up the drama. Maybe you find you hear or you find the trap because you hear the click as one of your party members steps <laughs> on a pressure plate or something like that. So you, they don't trigger the trap; they find it, but you hear it and be like, yeah. "Stop what you're doing." And then you can have like a little bit of moment of tension where the thief has to try to, you know, disable yeah. this trap. And then maybe you start to hear a scurry or some growls from down the hallway. And now you have someone on a trap, maybe a, maybe your archer or a spellcaster right. who's casting spells, protecting the thief that is getting them off yeah, this pressure yeah. plate. Because who, who knows, knows what's going to happen. Gonna happen. Yeah. I, I've um, heard a similar tip somewhere that, that's similar to what you're saying. Uh, and I cannot remember where, but it's basically letting the players know, okay, when I say click you can all immediately and we're talking like within the first few seconds can say what you do and then that's your response you might not need to make a save depending on what you do but yeah. it's up to you to decide do i jump forward do i jump back do i hit the ground do i turn you know go side to side whatever it is and then that gives you a bit of agency in terms of like what's mm -hmm. what your character does but it also still maintains that suddenness that, oh, my God, we didn't know this was here. Similar approach to like, you know, like uh, Dragon's Breath Weapon, where you telegraph before your actual turn. Like they're taking a deep breath and looking right at this cluster of you guys so that then the players can get out of the way, yeah. move something before the big attack comes. It's similar telegraphing that threat. But like if you just assume that the characters are competent adventurers that they would not have gotten to the point where they feel it's okay for them to go into dangerous places and and have an adventure then like a lot of this needing to check every corner every room every whatever um is you know that can be eliminated if they still insist on doing it then have the environment come after them are you guys really going to take 10 minutes every room for more 10 or more minutes like somebody's going to find you somebody's going to come get you mm -hmm. um and then, you know, whether or not they respond to that is, uh, you know, do with that whatever you will, right? Some, some players would like that, yeah. you know, the world reacting to them. Others will see it as a, uh, you know, mm -hmm. antagonistic. So, Yeah, uh, one last point on that. 
on that exact thing is when when I was playing the the a fantasy game with the home group Audie and Jage, and he was playing a thief. He was really having fun with it, but like after a few adventures, he, even he was just like, I'm I'm finding harder to figure out different ways to say the same thing. I'm yeah. like, well, you don't have to. Just when the first thing you come to, describe yeah. how you do it, uh, and then after that, you just say, okay, I'm checking for traps, and I know like. how yeah. what you're doing. Um, and I'll tell you if you need to roll or that it, yeah. if it matters, because only for the consequence yeah, does yeah. it matter. That's that's very um, true, right? And, so uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to handle this. If you're playing fifth edition, just sort of looking at at the ways that automatic success can come about. But I would just start off with letting them know you do not need to do this. Either I will telegraph threats, mm -hmm. or or when it's relevant, I'll let you, you know. I'll let you know what your characters see. But like as a rule, you do not need to do this because we are assuming your characters do it. Uh, is is a good way to start. Right. <laughs> the gamers. Well, of course, right, I'd be but checking that's the thing, traps. right? Uh, it, it, yeah, it's that's the, the other the side the of other that. Side of course, of I would be checking for traps. I'm a competent adventurer, so the, you, you didn't, didn't say it. Say well, that's it. some mother may I DM shit. You know? <laughs> that is, yeah. No, it is. What if you just flipped it on its head? I'm all. I'm always assuming yeah, that the rogue is checking rogue. for traps. I mean, that's you have one job. <laughs> they're a rogue. Come on. <laughs>